Hi, it's Nash from Alpha Phi, and today I'm going to answer a question I've been getting recently, which is essentially how much life insurance can I get? So some people have said, okay, I'm in, I'm all in, just give me as much as you can. And it's like, whoa, 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 okay, let's talk about this. One, let's just make sure this is the right thing to do. And two, there are some limitations on to how much insurance you can get and how much money you can stuff into these policies. So both from a uh, practical, you know, balancing, financial balancing standpoint, but also the companies have limitations that we need to be aware of. So that's what I'm going to go through here today. First, let's talk about the types of insurance. So basically term versus whole life. And the reason I'm talking about this is because Jumping ahead, the answer about how much you can life insurance you can get is tied to the death benefit. So first off, term insurance, the cheapest form of insurance. So lower premiums, um, you, you can set it up in different ways, buys you so much death benefit. So in this example, a million bucks. So you set up the policy. Normally, it's for 10, 20, 30 years, whatever, and you pay in your premium and you get your death benefit. Less than 1% of these policies actually pay out because you know they're generally during your working years and not as many people statistically die during those years some unfortunately do and it, it is the cheapest form of insurance because statistically companies know that there's a very low likelihood that they're actually going to pay out if you try and get term insurance uh when you're over 65 this is what happens the uh the costs explode uh, for a whole life policy, the you know it as in, indicated in the name, it's for your whole life, meaning you have a level premium for your whole life, and as long as you abide your portion of the contract, these pay out one hundred percent of the time. There is no, there is no uh, non payout policies or anything like that. When you die, there will be a death benefit, and it will be paid out as long as you know you're keeping your end of the bargain. And the death benefit and cash value have a relationship and they, they should grow over time with dividends and earnings and interest. So um, just wanted to give a quick recap on the types of insurance and uh, how the death benefit is kind of structured and you know the relative payouts. So back to the question, how much life, how much life insurance can I get, which in our situation is really more about how much cash value can I get access to, how much money can I stuff into these policies? And essentially, it's hard to answer because it'll be different because companies apply limitations on death benefit, which is going to be different for each individual. And the reason is, is the death benefit and cash value have a relationship that is dependent upon design, age, health, and gender, uh, for example, like a younger person will have a higher death benefit for a given premium because those premiums are amortized over your life. So they're assuming you're going to one, not, you know, you're further away from your, you know, saying goodbye to this world, but also those premiums are spread out and you're, you're going to pay for longer, you know, if you uh, do it the traditional way um, and all these other things. So, okay, how do I know how much death benefit I can get? They really look at this as what is your earning potential over your working life? And when you submit an application, you're really getting qualified for the death benefit. Not all the designs and all of that. They do care a little bit, but really it's just how much uh, earning potential does this person have over their life? And let's qualify the death benefit on that. And then you can always take out a policy for a death benefit less than the qualified amount, but never more they would send it all the way back through underwriting again. Okay, so I made this uh, general table. We have the age over here. And really, as I said, it's about how much income potential do you have over your lifespan. So younger people will have a higher income multiplier uh, to get to the death benefit than older folks, just because you have less working years, presumably, in your life left, um, you know, to to cover that essentially for your family in, in, the, in the case that you were to pass away. So 30 to 35, there's a range here because it depends on the company. So this is kind of the general guidance here, uh, but it will come down to situation to situation. So 30 to 35X 
a hypothetical income of 100 grand is 30 times 100 grand is 3 million and 35x time, times 100 grand is 3.5 million. So for the same income for a relatively young person and a relatively older person, the death benefit is going to be drastically different or, or the death benefit that you can qualify for is going to be drastically different. So really good to know. And this is why uh, people say, hey, When's the best time to start one of these policies? Well, yesterday, just as kind of relating to your age and especially the compounding and the growth over time. So this is one way they look at it. The other way is that basically some clients can qualify through assets as opposed to income. Some folks have little reported income, um, but a huge amount of assets, say real estate or whatever. So you can always say, hey, I am protecting are assets for future generations and you know I'm I'm taking care of it and although I don't have a big reported income if I were to pass away then all of that would be uh under threat for my family and my legacy. So those are the two kind of different ways generally we can think about it. Uh other things to note while we're on the topic is that a spouse non-working as a matter uh wife or husband, non-working spouse can generally qualify for about 50% of what the other spouse has in force. Now, the reason that is, is, you know, say a spouse is taking care of the kids, the other spouse is the, uh, you know, working and earning for the family. If the the non-working spouse, the spouse taking care of the kids were to pass away, unfortunately, then the other spouse would obviously not, be, presumably not be able to continue working in the same capacity and would have, uh, you know, to take care of, of the kids or the, the family or whatever. Um, and so that's kind of the, the logic there and certainly uh, can qualify for a good amount of death benefit in this case. Kids, so less than 18 or juveniles, are limited to 50% of what the adult application or owner has in death benefit. So, you know, it it's going to look weird if you have, um, let's say, a million in death benefit, and you want to get your your child a ten million dollar death benefit policy, right? It just raises some eyebrows. So fifty percent uh, is actually quite a bit. And then grandchildren will be on a case by case basis. You know, it's kind of uh, again more to why does this grandparent want a life insurance policy on their grandchild? So normally this is legacy uh, type of thing, and you know, just have to put that background together to explain to the underwriting teams. All right. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, please reach out, please like, and subscribe, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. If you enjoyed this video, please like, and subscribe. Also, you can learn more at alphacrusaders.com at the link at the end of this video.